ik myself in signal en nog iets. Het is glad niet gerecord nie, begin ah, ja, nie. Ja, het is een stuk gerecord en te sien dat ek het so groen ding gemaakt en te stop Oké, okay. okay, anyway, Linux scripting overview. Um, ja, like I said, we're not going to cover everything, we're just going to scratch the surface. So you guys have a good foundation to know what to Google. And um, a script file is basically just a list of <coughs> console commands. So you can have a script file that says dot forward slash prepare, and in the next line, you can say dot forward slash process web face, and in the next line, um, well, you can say maybe say pipe grep some keyword that you've used in your debugs. So there's all those options, but it's basically just a list of commands. But then there's additional, op and, and obviously each command is actually executable on the system. There's something else you can execute. So like for instance, echo, echo is actually ex executable on the system. You can actually just run it from the normal command line, you just type echo, and it will echo whatever you, echo, whatever you pass it, the parameters. So most of the scripting methods is actually <coughs> other executables that you call. It just does certain things. So in a normal programming language, like let's say Java, you would have something like um, system.out.printed, which is a function. But in um, Linux scripting, you just have echo. So it appears like a function, but it's actually another app that you're calling that gets started up. With its own environment, exactly like this, and it does certain things with output stuff. Okay, so um, yeah, <coughs> it's just basically the basic explanation of line scripting is a list of commands. The obviously the first line that's one thing I didn't add. The first line in your if, if you write a line scripting file, the first line must always be um, hash exclamation mark forward slash bin forward slash sh. There's two scripting engines, sh being the, the first one, which is just your normal shell scripting. Um, that one is basically the very, very first one that was invented. Um, most of your, you know, actually all of the Linux devices has this one. Um, but then you get an extended one that was developed later, and that was called bash. So if you're writing a bash script, you must say hash exclamation mark slash bin slash bash. I'm not sure what that stands for, but yeah. Um, that is the, the sort of the next generation one. So um, you need to pick either one or the other. So whenever you, whenever you write the Linux script file, the first line in that file must be that. Okay. okay. Unless obviously you decided to use bash, then it will be that one. If you use Bash, obviously your compatibility <coughs> of your script goes down because not all platforms will support Bash. Especially if you look at um, stuff like uh, Raspberry Pi. I'm not sure if the first Raspberry Pi could actually support the Bash. That one might only support the SA files. So, but nowadays, almost all Linux versions do support Bash. Doesn't matter where you are, because obviously it's a, it's just a more extendable language with uh, more functions. Stuff like if statements, while statements, for statements, stuff like that. Because these, if you have an if, a while, and a for, that's not executables. Okay, that's actually part of the language that makes scripting. Whereas all the other stuff like echo, read, um, all these stuff, top, who am I, set, awk, head, tail, yeah, all those things, they are actually executables. So, so majority of the stuff is executables, but we also have a small subset that is part of the language itself. With that make up these, basically these three statements are the, <coughs> the main three statements that you will use. Now when, a, when a, a, a script gets started running, obviously it starts up a process. Every script runs in a process, it is an app in that sense. It's a complete app that starts up, so input stream, output streams, error streams, input arguments and exit code. And all these things you can access from your script. And there's certain ways to do that, obviously. Um, if you want to access the input stream from your script, you just use the command uh, read. It is here somewhere. Oh, right. there. Read. Okay. So that one, um, just you can just Google sh space read. 
If you want to Google any of these commands, just Google the word sh, space, and then the command. And then you'll get a lot more information about it. Or in, um, in Ubuntu, for instance, you can actually say <coughs> um, man yeah. read. That stands for manual. So you can actually say man and then any of these words, and you can access the manual. It will actually open the text editor inside the console. And you can scroll up and down and explain stuff and give you some examples and stuff like that. So if you want to read the input stream, you can use the read command. You can even tell it to echo something before it reads it, like um, what is your name? And it will return a name. You can say it will only return when the person presses enter or whatever. You press enter twice or yeah, all sorts of funny things like that. Output stream that you can access with the echo command. That simply prints characters to the output stream. If you want to print something to the error stream, then basically what you do is you still use echo, but you tell that sub-process to link um, the output stream to the error stream. And I think you use this command. So you would say echo, space, what you want to echo, and at the end you say space to this. It's two bigger than ampersand one. Basically what this means is um, error stream, these streams are numbers. This is error stream one, and, or, or output stream one and two. So output stream uh, two must, must be inserted and merged with output stream one. So, or actually it's the other way around, I think. Yeah, I think if you want to write here, you have to say echo, that you must just Google. I think that's one bigger than ampersand two. Yeah, just Google that. How uh, to echo to the error stream. Then we'll explain that to you. Um, so that's how you write here. Yeah. Input arguments. That are all that's all variables. Now, in your process itself, you obviously have environment variables that I explained. I'm quickly gonna if you have a these environment variables is just variables that you can use. You can make your own variables, you just make them up on the spot and you just start using them. You don't declare them. You just basically say, there's, there's, there's two ways, obviously. One is, well, there's two methods. One is to assign a variable. So we just say the variable name equals, or whatever you want it to equal. So I use test and x here. Those are two variables. That's if you set the variables, or so you'll write to them. If you want to read from variables, you just put a dollar in front. Very important. If you want to read from variables, put a dollar in front. Otherwise, it's going to see it as text. Okay. Just a quick um, question. If you, for instance, used the test already, if you've set it to allow it, if you reset it, you also have to put the dollar sign in front of it. No, not, not when you set it. <coughs> okay. So every single time you set it, you just say test. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. No, 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 not just the first time. Every time. Every single time. Every time you change the value, you have to. You, okay. you, you, you don't put the dollar sign in front. Okay. So yeah, whether you said it the first time or the second time or the third time, let's give it Okay, cool. Okay, so these are environment variables. So this is how you access them. <coughs> Obviously, when your process starts up, there's already a lot of environment variables declared for you. That's where that other function comes in, the print. I think it's print env. It'll print all your environment variables for you. And you can actually see them. So it's almost like a debug which is actually quite a cool function. And your, your input arguments are stored in these variables. So when your app gets run or your script gets run, the actual script name, let's say we make a script and we call it test.sh. <coughs> that test.sh will be actually stored in a variable called zero. So if you want to read it, you say dollar zero. And it will actually return your script's name. Okay. If, uh, obviously, you pass a parameter, so you say space, hello, then the hello would be stored in one. You say space there, then the there will be stored in two. Obviously, if the hello there, the hello space there is in quotes, it will be seen as one argument. And those two words will be combined and <coughs> added in there, including the space and everything. Okay. So these are your input arguments. That's how you can access them. Um, your exit code, obviously, now you have to be specific what you're referring to. If you execute a command in your script, so in your script you say um, echo, 
echo the word test. What actually happens then, the exit code of echo, the command echo that executed, will be stored in a variable called question mark. So whatever the previous line was, the exit code will be stored in there. Okay. So this variable changes on every single line of your script. Except if it's one of these. If, while, for, and there's a, there's a couple of others as well. This is not the only ones, but these are the main ones. So those are the, those are the only conditions where they don't change. But on every single line in your script, that variable is going to change because we need the exit code of the previous line. Does that make sense? Okay. If you want your script to send an exit code, obviously it needs to terminate. And that's when you use the exit command. So you can actually say exit space zero, or exit space one. Obviously exit space zero, as we know, means success. And anything else is an error code. So then this whole thing terminates and it sends that as the exit code. Okay, makes sense. So that's basically the idea of how you have a script running, it's general commands that you execute, but you can access all these things and utilize them and change them and do all those kind of things. Very important when, when the terminal starts up or when, the, when your script starts up. Basically what, what happens is that your terminal, your window that you type in, is actually an app. It is a bash application. So what actually happens is when you start the terminal, Linux basically starts a window and inside the window it starts up this thing. It physically runs bash in there. Obviously, if yours doesn't support bash, it will probably run sh. But that is a bash terminal. So, when, so that in itself is a process like this. So when you start up your script, it actually takes this process, which is your terminal, it starts up a child process with the same user. You can't log in. <coughs> But what it does is it, it looks at your terminals, um, obviously your keyboard is an input to your terminal, and the text is an output from your terminal. So your keyboard is in there, your output is, is the terminal's text. But when your terminal starts up your script, it basically links its input to your script's input, which is the keyboard, by default, obviously, by default. And it takes your script's output and it plugs it into the terminal's output, which is the screen. You can obviously modify that with all the modifiers. I've discussed in the previous lesson, you remember the list we had here, with the pipes, the bigger than, smaller than, those things. You can actually tell your terminal to not link the input stream to the, your script input stream, but to, do, to send it somewhere else. Okay. Um, I'm just going to quickly go, I'm just going to quickly see if I've okay, got variables, input documents, exit codes, yes, this is an error stream, yes, okay, these things. There's a couple of operators inside your, we've already covered this one obviously, but these two, um, asterisk is a wildcard, that usually is for files, that is interpreted by the sh or the bash scripting, so whenever you give an asterisk, it basically gets, uh, gives you a list of files and it's space separated. Very important, space separated. So if you run a command, um, let's say dot forward slash uh, test dot sh. Okay, so that's a script we've written. And we say space star. What that star will do is it will print out a list of all the files that we have in our current directory. So it looks at the current directory that we are on. And um, let's say there's five files in that current directory. What the shell actually does is it doesn't actually pass the star as a parameter to your script. It actually goes and writes the files. So it will say file uh, number one, whatever the file name is, space, file number two, space, file number three. And it will just carry on like that. Okay. So um, that's quite a powerful tool to use where if you start your script and you want your script to work on lots of files, you can execute your script with that star wildcard. 
in your when you execute it, you can also tell it to not be a complete wildcard, but a partial wildcard. Where you can say you only want files starting with certain letters. Or starting with certain letters and ending with certain letters. So you can say you only want files starting with um, let's say D D asterisk and just like that. Then it will return you all the files in the current directory that starts with DD. If you want them to end in ZZ, then it will give you all files starting with DD and ending with ZZ. Okay. You can even get creative and you can make that a folder and you can put, let's say, other files there. Test.txt. Then it will basically pass all test.txt files that is in folders <laughs> that starts with DD and ZZ. It ends with ZZ. So you can also get quite creative with the asterisk character. Makes sense. Cool. Um, okay, and then there's the this thing. You've probably seen that as well being used. That just points to your home directory. So every user has a home directory. Root's home directory is a slash or slash root. Uh, your home directory is usually home slash your username. So if you say, um, so what you can actually do here is you can actually pass it. So it doesn't matter where the script is executed or where you are currently when you execute this. You can actually just do that. That basically tells the terminal, which is bash or sh, that it must put, a, put your folder for your home directory in there. So what it will actually do is it will take that out and put slash home slash your username in there. So what you can also do is you can actually append that. You can say slash uh, test.txt. So that means execute your script, pass it a parameter of a file that's in your home directory called test.txt. Okay. Cool. Um, yeah, now I'm just going to go through some of these commands. Like I say, it's, it is actual executables, but you can see them as functions or methods that you can call, and they return results. If you want to um, store a command's result in a variable, because that's going to happen a lot, where you have a, a, a variable, let's say test, but we want to store something in there. Let's say we want to store the last line in a certain file in a variable called text. What you can then do is you can use the backwards <coughs> character. You guys know what the backward is? No. Not. Yeah. Okay. It's in the same key on your keyboard as this one. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's like another type of quote. It's like a single quote, but it's, uh, it's angled. It's the one you use on MySQL for table names. Yes, stuff. it's that one. That's the backward character. So you can actually say, another way to set it is you can actually say um, test test equals and then backwards then you can put a command in there so you can then say let's say uh, tail dash in uh, test <coughs> dot txt backward then basically what that tells your the bash executor to execute the command tail dash in text dot txt and whatever it returns on its output stream it will return and put it into the test variable as its value. Okay. Um, the tail command, what that does is, whatever parameter you give it there, it'll only return the last couple of lines. Actually, sorry, there should be an in one day. Yeah. So basically what I've told the tail command here is to return the last bit of the file, because it's tail, dash n one, basically means the last line, of this file. So we'll return the last line of that file and store the result in the test variable. Okay. Um, yeah, then you have all these, these are all your commands. Cat basically prints out a file. So you pass it a file and it will print out the whole file. It will return it as an output stream. So you can then say, so yeah, you could have, could have just said cat text.txt. And then the whole text.txt would be in this variable. Uh, sort, 
Actually, I haven't actually used the sort before, but I know that it's good for internet everywhere. You give it a lot of lines of lines of text, and it just sorts it for you. So it basically you send a lot of lines of text into its input stream when you execute it, um, and then output stream will then output the sorted lines. Um, tail, I've just explained. Netcat is a very powerful networking tool that basically you can say create the socket to there and send. And then basically what does it, well, as soon as it creates the socket, then it will link the input stream to that socket. And your output, or the socket output stream to your output. So whatever comes through that socket, will then be printed to the terminal, whatever you type in the keyboard will go into the socket. Yes, like the test we did the other day. Okay, very powerful tool for networking. LS, obviously to list directory contents. Head is the opposite of tail. It will print you out the first couple of lines. Orc, very powerful tool. Um, that is a language in itself. That is basically um, all the stuff that SH couldn't do, that basically built Orc to do. It's a whole language in itself. I'm not going to go into it. I haven't worked with it much, but I know there's people that actually use that to do quite a lot of statistical stuff and search the text files and all sorts of funny stuff. So you basically specify input files and you have like code that you write it executes it based on the text, it'll execute commands and swap arguments around, it does like a whole lot of things. That you need to read up on your own. Okay. But that's also available in most distributions of Linux. Send is a string editor. That's what it stands for, string editor. Or stream editor actually. Basically what that does is whatever comes in the input stream, it'll just send out an output stream. But you can tell it to replace the certain things. So you can say, when it finds this specific characters in the input stream, replace it with this. Else, just send it straight through. Okay. Um, echo, you guys know. <clears throat> PWD, that's Print Working Directory. A very powerful one. If you want to know where you are in the system, what folder is the, currently work, is the current working directory? Because each process, when it starts up, well, it's not actually when it starts up, but yeah, when it starts up, it gets set initially. Each process has a working directory. What this means is that whenever anything inside the process, whether it's a Java process or C++ process or, or a <coughs> scripting process, whenever it refers to a file, okay, but it does not start with a forward slash, then it puts the working directory in front of the file. Okay, so it's called relative paths. So, and that's the same with Windows as well. If you just refer to a file and just say file uh, test.txt, then because there's no slash in front of the file, the line doesn't start with a slash or the file name doesn't start with a slash, the system will see it as a relative path. So what it will do is it will, take, it will find the current working directory in the current app. It's part of the process. It's an environment, environment variable. And it will just put it in front of it. Then it knows the full path, which we call the absolute path. So whenever you refer to a file, you can refer it, you can refer to it in an absolute way or in a relative way. Absolute way, you just put a slash right in front, uh, but then you have to obviously you start with a slash and you have to put the whole path in. Because that starts at the base of your PC. It doesn't start in home or wherever you are now. If you just put the file name, it'll automatically put the current working directory in front of it. Okay, so print working directory, just print that out for you. You can't do the um, dot dot forward slash dot dot forward slash and then whatever the file's name is. Yeah, but that's still relative. Yeah. Because dot dot forward slash says start my current working directory. Go back. Go back one yeah. directory. That's what that means. Yeah. It just means the parent directory. So it's still not absolute, but it still uses the current yeah. directory. Makes sense? Yeah. Does that explain it? Okay. No, 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 no. okay, cool. And um, who am I is quite cool. It just tells you what your current user is. <laughs> so if your username is Owen, then you can execute that or return Owen. Um, PS is this your process list, current running processes. And yeah, each of these commands, you must actually do a man on them. Do a man on each of these commands, and you'll see how much parameters you can give them. You can set them up to, yo, it, it's just amazing. I mean, like the PS one, you can tell it, 
must it send the list of processes through here or must it send it through here? Or must it send it to a file? Or must it format it in colors? Or must it add certain columns, what the memory usage is? Or must it only show your processes? Must it show all the processes? It's got a, like a list of parameters like this. And that's each of these commands. So you must actually just go man and read up on these things. And then you'll see that's where sort of the power comes in. It's not the scripting per se that actually makes this powerful. It's all these commands and all the different parameters that you can give them. And how you can configure them to send the data where you want and how to format them and stuff like that. Okay. Um, kill, that's just to kill the process. Usually use kill space in the process ID. Top, uh, very similar to PS, but it shows the process with the most CPU usage. It just ranks them. And it shows other stuff as well, like swap use, memory use. It's like, almost like a system monitor for command line. CHMOD, that's just change, uh, changing permissions. CHOWN, that's changing ownership. Exit, which I will explain. VI, Vim, and Nano, those are all text editors. Those you're not really going to use inside your scripts because they're going to start a physical text editor. Unless you want your script to actually start the text editor and like edit the file. When it's done, it carries on with the script, which is actually quite cool. I think we have something like that. There's somewhere we have actually used that. But yeah, it, you start a script, it does a lot of things, and then suddenly it just opens up a text editor. And you type in some things, and then as soon as you exit the text editor, the script goes on. Because your text editor, your whole session while it's editing, is like executing one command. So as soon as it's done, it goes to the next line. Um, MKDIR, which is make directory, so you can create a folder. Um, export, that's quite a, that's quite a, a, a one that you can use quite a, a lot. That is when you have a um, environment variables and you're, you start a child process. Okay. Well, actually, in this case, you are the child process because the initial process is the, is the actual terminal. What you can then do is you can say export and you give it a variable. What it will then do is the child process, obviously the child process will sit here. And that's your script. Let's see, you've got a variable in there called test. You can say export test. Then it simply copies that variable to the current okay. process. Then the current process can suddenly access that variable. Okay, which is quite cool. Uh, sometimes you want people to execute one command or one script do certain stuff, it exports the variables, then you want them to, to run another process. So after your process or your script is run, it will run another one, and then that one just simply reuses the same variables as the previous one, and carries on with the whatever task it was that was executed. Okay. Um, read, I've explained, and print environment, I've also explained. Okay. Systems for running. <coughs> cool. Um, now I'm just going to quickly go through the whiles and the ifs and the fors. They're pretty basic. It's not uh, difficult stuff. Um, obviously, if you know coding, then this is going to be pretty straightforward. Um, these two obviously are loops, how to loop, and this one's condition based. So, if statement if you have to have a square bracket. There is some other statements you can put in here. Um, like for instance, you can actually put a command here in, in here, I think. So you can actually say if um, make the uh, and, and directory, then whatever. So what it will actually do is it will actually execute that command. If the exit code is zero, it will be this. If it's not zero, it will carry on with the rest. So it can, you can do that as well. Um, but yeah, mostly we don't use it often. Mostly we use this kind of a syntax. We say bracket, uh, quote, quote, dollar, test, quote, equals, quote, quote, one, whatever, what over value you want to have in there. Semicolon, very important. Um, actually, with all these, the after your condition, if the next word is in the same line as the condition, you have to have a semicolon. If it's at the bottom line, so it's, it's there instead of yeah, then you can remove the semicolon. That's why these actually don't have semicolons. You can actually put the do there, but then you need to put a semicolon under the conditions. You can also put, if you want multiple conditions, the whole bracket just repeats. You have a bracket, yeah, and you say ampersand, ampersand, and then another bracket. 
and then a semicolon right at the end. Okay, so you can have multiple conditions. You don't say else if, you just say alif, if there's an else if. Else is else, and the if statement ends with a fee, which is the reverse of if. That's where basically to say that the whole if statement terminates. Okay, there's a couple of other commands that also follow that same convention. Yeah. I can't remember what they are, <coughs> but where you basically the initial yeah, word, you just reverse the letters yeah. to keep at the ending of it. So there's no brackets like in Java. Um, these are like keywords that signifies the spaces and what code would be executed if that is true and if that one's true or if that one's true. Okay. Okay, now the while loop. Very similar. Since while, so condition, case. Isn't that one of them that switches around? Oh, it might be a, a switch. Switch, or one of those ones. Like yeah. That. Oh, I can't remember. Um, I was confused between all the scripting languages. Yeah. There's, there's <laughs> a lot of them. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, obviously, while you have condition, do your code, and done. Like I said, you can put the do there, but then you need the semi Uh For is a little bit of a tricky one, and it's very different to the fours that you are used to. You can actually say four, and then you put your variable there, without the dollar, okay? Because you can't technically set it. So I just use the variable i, but you can put the word test in there, obviously for test variable, and you say in, and then there you put a collection. That collection is basically, um, you can generate a collection by using curly braces like this. So you say curly braces zero, so I think it's three dots, zero dot 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 five. What that actually does is it removes this thing and says zero, space one, space two, space three, space four, space five. Okay, so that's actually how it writes it out. So you can, you don't have to put this, you can actually put in there zero, space one, space two, space three, space four, space five, and it will be exactly the same. Or you can put an asterisk, because as we know, an asterisk will actually print all the files in the current working directory, all that matches whatever wild card we pass it, and space separate them. So you can actually say 4i in asterisk. Then every time it loops, i will be equal to a different file name. Yeah. So now you can execute um, commands using obviously that variable, for each time with a new file, okay, which is quite cool. Um, yeah, I think that covers sort of the summary of it it is it's a, it is a little bit it's a lot of work that i need to go through so yeah it, it was it was, it was a difficult one to summarize it yeah. <laughs> in like a couple of minutes it can get quite yeah but like i say actually if you just go and you do mans on these things and you see how powerful they are those are the ones that i could remember there's probably still a lot more um this as well there's a lot of other operations as well that shell scripting supports. So these aren't the only ones. And I think that covers the basics. I think from here, at least when you read something in Google, you understand what they're referring to. If you see these things, if you see that, if you see an if statement, you know, okay, that's what they're doing. If you see a pipe character, if you see a bigger than, if you see ampersand, ampersand, you know what they are actually referring to. Okay. Is there any questions? Yes. Okay. Can you write start off scripts or shut down scripts that run before you actually in the operating system? Yes. Those, that, that's actually a script that already exists. Okay. You can obviously call your script from it. Yeah. And that is stored in um, uh, slash etc. etc is like uh, the settings directory for, for Linux. Okay. Any settings will be stored in etc. Um, Linux got a couple, a couple of base directories. Uh, for instance, slash var is where you usually store data, massive amounts of data you store in slash var. Slash etc is where we store settings. Slash bin is where we store executables. So they've got lots of, you can slash share as well, where shared things are stored that's sort of where the different users can access them. Temp is also one of them. So there's lots of those base folders. Yeah. So you may, maybe you just need to read up on that. Okay. So slash etc is settings, and then the file is called rc. Dot local. That file gets executed um, just before your final session starts, I think. Okay. 
So your yeah, final you, run level starts. Yeah, you actually put your process inside that file. Will that mm. execute before it before yes. loads up? Right? Yeah. Just be very aware. In uh, a lot of the new systems, yeah. this file's already populated. There's already stuff in there. Okay. And the, the very bottom line says exit space zero. Obviously, you mustn't put your code below oh, that because that will never yeah. be executed. <laughs> so just see if there's an exit code zero. Just make sure your stuff goes before that. Okay. Okay. And the same question with shutdown. Is there a file that you can edit where once Linux shuts down, where it runs yours before it switches off? Actually, I don't know. I, I assume there is. I've just never needed to do that. So, so I, never, I don't know. All right, cool. But yeah, it's something interesting to, to research. To research. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But like I say, this is a normal uh, shell script. Okay. You can just do normal command. Whatever command you put in the console, you can put in there. Okay, cool. Uh, and you can actually put these things in the console, eh? Yeah. If you open your terminal, yeah. you can actually put these type of in the terminal. As you type, it will actually execute it. So it's actually it's interesting. You can actually do exactly what you can do. You can set up variables. You can in your in your terminal you can say test equals hello. Enter. And it will just return, it'll do nothing. But then you can say maybe say echo space dollar test. Yes. Yeah. And then it will actually print out hello. So you can actually test some of these things without even scripting. You just type into your terminal. Because your terminal technically is a script. It's just you type it as you go. <laughs> So actually, you typing in your terminal, you're actually creating a script without you knowing it. <laughs> and your history is sort of a list of that script. <laughs> okay. Cool. Any other questions? No, that's it. Cool. Are you happy? Yeah, I'm fine. The, the, the grub will be in that, uh, that etc folder. Um, yeah, that's grub settings, yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah. Grub has actually got anything to do with this. Yeah, I'm just I think your boot loader yeah. actually starts up everything. I think it actually starts your init process as well. It gets started by Grub. Okay, so the very first process that gets started in Linux is started by Grub. Grub sets up that process, configures it, and says go. And then, yeah, everything else just spawns from there. Okay, cool. Awesome. Very happy. You learned something there? Yes. yes. Yeah, like I say, this is very, very just skimming the surface, but there's, there's, there's just too much. I'm going to have to do 20 videos just on this to cover everything. So the rest you're going to have to Google. <laughs> okay, cool. Awesome. Cool.